You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 2nd, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, tools to assess asthma control. Our presenter is Dr. Chitra Dinakar. She's a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine and on the faculty of the Allergy Division at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. talk on nitric oxide as a main focus um, because we use that at our institution and that's something you're not familiar with maybe in other places. But then I realized that um, maybe we need to go over some of the asthma control tools too. Also because um, Brad Chips and myself, we are writing an asthma clinical report, clinical to assess asthma control in children which should come out in pediatrics as well, pediatricians. I've given you excerpts of that. I can't obviously give you the full thing till it's in print, but uh, that's part of what is worth <coughs> going to talk today. I thought I'd incorporate the whole concept of using tools in clinics to monitor asthma control. What can we use? What's feasible? So the objectives are to use the tools to measure asthma control in clinical care. I'm not talking about specialized things. Uh, identify patients with asthma who would benefit from ENO measurements to identify what's low, what's normal, what's elevated, and look at factors that affect those levels so that uh, you don't always get uh, blown up, uh, over by a very high level. It could be that there were some factors that caused that. I don't know if you guys are doing pre and post test. Do you need to do that? Is this CME? I had prepared this as part of the CME thing. But anyway, let's just see if you guys uh, can guess an answer. Don't tell it out because at the end we'll discuss it. Then so asthmatic children, a serial change in the AC score of what magnitude is going to be significant. I think I've managed to tell the second year fellows this number, but I don't know if the first years yet know. So that's something that's important because as you do the asthma control test, you want to know between today and next uh, visit, three months later, did you actually do something useful or was it just chance? So uh, that kind of helps it. These are some numbers I threw out. The next question is you actually got some ENO levels and you're looking at elevated ENO more than 15 parts per billion. Does that help indicate that the child may be responsive to steroid therapy or not? And the third question is um, if you find that the level in your child is more than 35 parts per billion, and notice that I'm using parts per billion for ENO, and more than 50 parts per billion in adults with asthma despite therapy, what are you going to think of? Poor adherence, poor inhaler technique, inadequate ICS dose, steroid resistance, primary ciliary dyskinesia. So, so just all the following except. This is an except question, which is the kind of question you're not supposed to get in your peace boards or your allergy boards anymore, and you won't find that. But uh, part of the questioning from here is also to try and teach you what causes elevated, what not, the subtle kind of thing. So. Okay, coming to measures of asthma control, I'm not going to go over what's asthma control. You all know it. You use it in your practice every day, so I won't go through the NIH guidelines. Data. But the measures can be classified as subjective and objective. Obviously, subjective is what the patient says, and objective is what you can get. We can never underscore the importance of detailed uh, history taking enough. It's obviously the most important. Um, as I saw, uh, one of uh, faculty from another place at a meeting say, you can walk in, the, depending on how long you want your visit to be, you can walk into a room and say, oh, the asthma doing okay? The patient's going to say, yeah, and you're done with the visit. Or you could actually say, tell me about the problems you had. And, uh, you know, and you can make the visit longer and actually get better history. So still history taking is very important. And there's something called composite asthma control scores and then quality of life measures. We don't really use quality of life measures in asthma here. As in most centers, it's more a research setting use. You might notice we use quality of life measure in our immunotherapy patients. I don't know if you know that. We use that. We track them serially. Uh, so when they come for their allergy shots, over, over, we have a, a formula when we do it, and then we collect it because we like to show that they actually improve in their quality of life. We're not really doing it for asthma. It's more, like I said, a research setting, more because of the complexity of the question. This gives you an idea of the asthma control tools and the ages at which they're applicable. So zero to four years, the one that's applicable is called TRAC, as you know. 
uh, as we use track here. It's more a respiratory score, not necessarily an asthma score, and it's kind of helpful. And then 5 to 11 years or older children, you can see there's quite a range. Um, we tend to use the C-ACT, which is the asthma control uh, test, for ch childhood asthma control test. And the reason we use that is because we actually have had a lot of familiarity with it, and I'll show you the history behind it. But it's also part of the guidelines as a recommended suggested test. ACT is recommended or suggested in the C-ACT, um, just by logic, seems to also be part of it. But there are many other tools, uh, and that's why I give you these handouts. You have more information on that, which you can go later for your own use. And in 12 years and older, you have the ACT, the Asthma Control Test, and the Asthma Control Questionnaire. Uh, there, there are slight differences, and certain practices will use one or the other. We use the ACT because it's richly filled out by the patient in the waiting room, and it's very helpful. Uh, we've actually had patients think about the questions and then remember, realize that there were certain aspects they could ask us about that they didn't think. And the best part of the childhood asthma control test is you find the parent and the child disagreeing on the score. And, and things like the child says, uh, the mom says, I didn't know you were requiring a role in the PE. And the child says, yeah, what? You know, and stuff like that is kind of a, an eye-opener even for their relationship and for us to understand what's going on better. So that's the beauty of some of these tests. Then 18 years and older, which we are not really dealing with here, you have other options, and then you have, another, again, a range of options, most of which are used in most settings. So coming to the ACT, as you've seen it, it's a five-item questionnaire. It's a composite numeric score, and it actually measures the different domains of uh, asthma control as measured by the guidelines. The minimal clinically important difference is three points, as um, some of you may know. So if you go from 17 to 20, you've made a difference. Mm -hmm. If you go from 19 to 21, 19 to 20 or 19, you still may have got the control range, but it may not be something you did. So that's the important part of it. Again, these are few studies that validated it, so it may vary. And as you know, there is a subjective question in the ACT and the C Act which says, how do you rate your asthma control? And it's subjective. I will tell you that from my experience, and I've done this ACT a lot, Teenagers always rate it well, unless they're wheezing to the point that if you go to the ED, they're going to say, I have good control. That's just how optimistic teenagers are. And on the other hand, children who are uh, in the childhood asthma control test, because they cough a little bit, they'll say, I'm really bad. <laughs> they actually would be fine in coughing for two days. They'll say, I'm really bad. It really affects me. So it's very interesting how perception is different uh, in different age groups. And the C Act is, again, a seven-item questionnaire. And what's nice is four is filled out by the child. And sometimes in the younger ages, the children are not that clear about filling it out. And find actually the parent putting it in. But still, it's helpful and take questions by the parent and caregiver. And the composite score is 27. But again, you use control greater than 19. And that's kind of been said. And if it's less than 14, it means the child is quite bad or exacerbating. Typically, it's like a yellow zone uh, is, is a thing. Or uh, they are misperceiving the symptoms, they're thinking, all oh, cough is asthma. And I will tell you, I have seen a zero score. I've seen it a few times there on ACT. You're really bad. It's really bad. They're just sitting in clinic. They're just trying to be incubating them on the spot again. Mm -hmm. It's very funny how people's perception of some of the questions can vary. And then we use the track, control is 80 or more, just so you know. And uh, you'll find a lot of our kids don't really meet the control criteria for whatever reason, because they come to us when they're sick. So don't feel too disappointed about the result. But that's something I think you guys need to know, because they're using this in our practice. So the ACQ and the ATAC, I'm just giving you the information. We're not using it, but you can file it away for your reference. How did this all start? It started sometime in 2006, 2007. When um, GSK actually had an asthma web tracker, and I was really interested. The guidelines just came out, and I thought we really need to do ACT institution-wide because we are, um, as specialists, uh, very knowledgeable about, uh, and we have the time to ask patients detailed questions. But in a busy pediatric practice or a busy adult practice, it's very hard. And we wanted to get a standardized questionnaire that would help the doctors get some of the information without them having to ask. And all they needed to do is follow up on some of their low scores. So we started this um, asthma control web tracker, very interesting. It actually was a website where we put in stuff which was specific to our institution. We had a contract. And we tracked uh, asthma control test scores real time. And what was nice about it is we could actually benchmark 
the feedback. So it tells you that in March, what was how many patients did you get who were uncontrolled, and then in April, how many did you get? So you could kind of see how you're improving. You could also compare one provider against another anonymously. So it would kind of help you know how things are going. So it's very useful. And Dr. Dowling actually used this as for a fellowship to show that you guys were doing something useful because your ACT scores would improve over time as you improve the fellowship. So it was a good sort of objective marker to show that you were impacting on asthma, but above all, show that you are impacting on your patients. Now, there are always variables. You can't control you getting more new patients, you getting more complex patients, and that might affect it. But uh, it was very interesting to see that certain providers seem to be to impact on the asthma a little bit better. We did some um, studies on it, looking at comparison with FEV1 and stuff like that. Uh, but then in 2011, we had um, Helen Murphy join uh, somewhere around that time. I don't remember the exact date. And we started doing the paper ACT. We also uh, moved on to Cerner and wanted to document into our EMR and not have a separate tracker. That took a lot of effort to do it. Then now we have an iPad version. And our goal was to improve the percent of ACT or SEAC documented in the EMR from 17%, which was our baseline that we found at that time, to reach a goal of 75% institutionally. And uh, we have certainly met that, which is awesome. So 75% uh, of our patients have ACT or SEAC documented. You'll see that in the asthma action plan. And this is something that we can really uh, feel very happy about uh, because uh, it's been challenging for many institutions and places to get this done and that we've been able to accomplish it is really good. Again, we can look at, uh, you can look, you see the printout, right, the ACT over time for your own patient, which is such a helpful marker. Um, so that's the beauty of it. So I would recommend uh, ACT and CAC tracking when you go into your practice. Uh, there are a lot of limitations to those. Uh, they're sometimes frustrating. Like I said, the score is zero and the child is perfectly all right, and you have to distort it with a good measure of what the patient thinks, uh, and then you can uh, titrate your teaching to that. Assessment of lung function is obviously an uh, objective measure. We do spirometry. We can do peak flow, which we don't do much in our institution at this point just because um, it, it's, a, it's an adherence issue. Many people just don't end up doing peak flows, and it's not been found to be superior necessarily to doing symptom-based monitoring of your asthma control. Uh, I won't talk about that. And then we have the evaluation of every hyperresponsiveness and methacholine. Uh, I'm happy to give you the paper when it comes out. We'll be talking about that a little bit, but that will be for a separate talk. And then biomarkers, which is the focus of my talk today. So bronchial constriction is obviously a key component of asthma that's well recognized. And that's picked up by your lung function measures, right? The spirometry and the peak flow and or total lung function. But what we don't find is inflammation, which is uh, <laughs> obviously something you want to get. Uh, and clearly, while we enjoy all these different forms of donuts, and probably the, the one at the extreme the most, the one with the least inflammation is what we want to shoot for our patients. So inflammation, and if you think about it, asthma is defined as a chronic, reversible, obstructive, uh, episodic airway disease with inflammation. So chronic inflammation, but it's amazing that we didn't have a test to measure inflammation and we kept using that definition over and over again. And the only measures we had of inflammation, which was not very easy to do, were bronchoscopy, bronchial wash, bronchial lavage, and biopsy, which we are not really doing on every patient. It's not going to be possible to do it. So it was really limited to research settings and when you really needed it. We were doing indirect measures, what we call non-invasive airway hyperresponsiveness, sputum investigation, looking for eosinophils, um, breath condensates, and exhale nitric oxide. And of these ones, exhale nitric oxide is the one that has become a clinical tool that we can use, and therefore we'll talk about it. We have had experience with breath condensates um, uh, because we were participating in some studies where you collect it, it's really, they breathe out and this ice cold thing is in, it immediately condenses, you collect that, and you measure all kinds of chemicals, and the idea was to actually get a profile of mediators, not just you know, but different things that would. But it's a complex thing and it hasn't become a clinical tool yet. It's in a research setting. So what's a biomarker? Biomarker tries to identify characteristics that are objectively measured and evaluated as indicators of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological responses. So it's a broad kind of uh, definition. And uh, as you can tell, asthma care has evolved over time. From the 1960s, when all we were focused on, and this is really nice for you to get a history of asthma, well, in the 1960s, much before you guys were born, um, you, all we cared about was re relieving bronchospasm and giving albuterol or stuff like that. 
Uh, and then we talk more about preventing bronchospasm with the addition of theophylline like daily and stuff. And then we went on to preventing allergen-induced bronchospasm, which was the era of chromalin in the 1980s. And in the 1990s, we had the beautiful inhaled steroids, leukotriene modifiers, the long acting beta agonists, which really significantly improved uh, the ability to treat asthma. And we were focusing more on preventing and resolving inflammation. In the 2000s, we went one step further and actually tried to modulate the allergic response with anti-IgE. And now, as we move forward, we are thinking more of personalized medicine. Precision medicine, actually, is the key word now. Precision medicine, precision health. Uh, and we're also thinking of early intervention, and we're thinking of this beautiful word called prevention. We actually want to prevent asthma and see how we can do that. We don't want to treat it. So we look at patient characteristics, biomarkers, genetics, immunomodulators, and try to put it all together. Uh, this paper that came out in 2012 in JACI by my mentor at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Erzurum, who is one of the gurus of axial nitric oxide circle, Erzurum, which is an amazing um, uh, pulmonologist at the Cleveland Clinic who was one of the pioneers of ENL in the United States. And uh, she wrote this very excellent uh, review article that I recommend that you read at some point. But she talked about periostin that you guys have heard about. We are using it in some of the therapies as a marker. Uh, obviously, we are using nitric oxide, and we're using isoprostanes, and then we're using bromotyrosine, which is another marker that you may be familiar with, and I think Dr. Dowling is interested in doing some research on that. So these are different markers that we are now thinking may uh, be helpful. Um, and um, I, I just brought that out to show you that uh, periostin is now considered a biomarker of IL-13 activation. So. Uh, inflammation causes activate upregulation of inducible nitric oxide synthase and causes nitric oxide production. Uh, and uh, if you go the other way, there's eosinophil activation, uh, production of reactive oxygen species. Via eosinophil peroxidase, you get bromotyrosine. Via lipid peroxidation, you get isoprostine. So those are the different markers. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to focus on nitric oxide today. So what is NO? apart from one of the first things that a child <laughs> says. So, uh, it is a short-lived endogenously produced gas that acts as a signaling molecule in the body and was very <laughs> distinguished by getting the award of Molecule of the Year in 1992. So, you can be a molecule and you can still be recognized. Who <laughs> accepted that award? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, in 1998 was given for discovery of NO as a signaling molecule. So this was a huge discovery. And these are the scientists who were uh, recognized for this. So the beauty of it is, till then, we never had a gas that was a signaling molecule. You know, you thought of liquid and you thought of other kinds of paracrine. You know, that, but not a gas. And that was what was cool. But what was even more cool uh, uh, was that there were many uh, roles that nitric oxide played in the body, from neurotransmission to, of course, the famous action for Viagra, which is vasodilatation immunity. And at Children's Mercy, for instance, we use it for treatment of neonatal pulmonary hypertension. Dr. Trog has been part of a huge group that does this. And you know that's for treatment, not even for picking up as a surrogate marker. It also acts on the heart as a nitroglycerin acts as an animal donor, causing vasodilatation and protecting the heart from damage and cell death. So it's great. The only problem in asthma is we're not quite sure if it's a good guy or a bad guy. Um, there were lots of articles in the beginning about is it, is it a good player or a bad, is it pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, but and people argued about it, but the bottom line is it's a marker of inflammation, and that's how we're going to use it in the clinical arena. So NO is produced by inducible nitric oxide synthesis by the action of this enzyme on arginine, which produces citrulline, which is regulated by two mechanisms. One is by STAT1 under the influence of interferon gamma. So this can happen during viral infections, which is why we say if the kid has a URI, make sure you ask them that history uh, within a week or whatever. If you take your note, it may be high. There it's not the Th2 mechanism, it's the Th1 or interferon gamma pathway. In patients with asthma, INOS expression is upregulated by IL-4 and IL-13 through activation of STAT6 in the bronchial epithelium. And that, you know, is what we care about in terms of TH2-driven inflammation. So that's our focus about how we work. So how do we measure it? I don't know if you recognize one of our former fellows who's there on the wall, but that's Aubrey Ziegler. Dr. Ziegler helped me, and Mary Rickliff was one of our really awesome research coordinators who was with Susan Flack and Donna Horner, and then she left. So when I came here from the Cleveland Clinic, I had done bench research in nitric oxide along with a few people and Dr. Erzurum's lab. 
And I came here and thought I really need to apply this clinically to our patients because we didn't couldn't do spirometries in case and we, we needed to figure out do they have asthma and we need to know whether they have inflammation. Heck, how can I give anti-inflammatory? We didn't have a machine at that time, but um, Dr. Trope's group had the Sievers machine which measured uh, nitric oxide in patients who were intubated or you have to actually attach it to that to measure it. You can't like blow out and you can have that kind of a measure. So these are Cleveland Indian balloons you know, <laughs> the sports team, which I got with the help of my friend, Dan there, he made this contraption for me and I kind of carried it here, I had him export, send it to me, ship it to me. And so we had this nose clip and this kid blow out, but we collected the balloons and Mary and others ran uh, after collecting it to the neonatology unit and then would put it there and measure it and that's how we measure nitric oxide. I know we did cool oh. stuff. And uh, this is actually Susan Flack's kid centuries ago, or uh, just not centuries ago, many years ago, so adorable. But I wanted to measure nitric oxide in infants at that time because I thought that eczema was a risk factor for asthma and what if we could catch these kids early and start some treatment, immunomodulated treatment that prevented asthma, well, how great could that be? And actually we found, based on the study, that children with eczema there was, some, there was a profile of children with eczema who had elevated ENO levels and that they caused for the developed asthma, which has later been considered yeah, a possibility. But this is this uh, Susan who was a one-woman entertainment show because you have to get tidal breathing on these kids to do that. And on, you can imagine putting this contraption on little babies, right? So she had to do, this was up to 18 months, so she was doing this magnificent thing. Now, of course, we have instruments that have evolved from the NIOX, or original big, huge box that we had, to uh, this Niox Mino and now the Niox Vero that you guys are using. Um, so the device has evolved to a handheld thing that can be taken from clinic to clinic and not necessarily have to be stationary and not necessarily have to run to the neonatology unit to get done. How so, much do these devices usually cost? It's, they have priced it fairly competitively now. They have package deals. I'm not going to go into that because then I'd be speaking on a product. Um, but um, there, there are you can go to the website and they'll tell you these things. And they've made it so that it's sort of um, feasible to use. The problem is not the cost of it. The problem more is reimbursement. Um, there is a code for it. It's 95012. But not every state will reimburse for nitric oxide, even though there have been guidelines and everything, just because it's not been completely accepted as the task. So it's hard to displace spirometry and primary function tests as the gold standard. So to get a test that's superior to that and completely displaces it would be the only way the companies would pick up. So some companies have understood the value of monitoring inflammation and will, uh, some insurance companies and will agree to the test. So even at Children's Mercy, some uh, insurance companies will uh, reimburse and some will not. So uh, it just depends on how persuaded they are about the data and how willing they are to to have another test that adds a layer of uh, uh, information. I'll show you why we thought the information was very helpful and why we per pursued it, but it is a state-by-state state, uh, change and in company-by-company company thing. Um, so uh, it, is it standardized? Yes, it is. There are three task forces that have reviewed the technique um, by the American Thoracic Society. It's best measured before spirometric measures. So remember that if you want to, if you have to want to do ENO as an afterthought, wait for about half an hour before if you've done a PFT already. Okay, exhale rate of 50 meters per second is maintained within 10 percent for more than six seconds with an oral pressure of 5 to 20 millimeter water to ensure vellum closure. So the quick question is. A lot of ENOs produce in your sinuses and nose, and you want to make sure it doesn't contaminate what you're getting from the bronchial airways and the airways. And you saw me doing the nose clip in the other thing, but you don't need to do that really anymore because the device itself uh, generates that water pressure so your palate will close and you will not get contamination in the sinus and the nose. Having said that, if you have a cold and you have a whopping amount of ENO in your nose, it's going to come through, which is why we tell you not to do that. So, um, and I'll tell you the other uh, extreme where if you have very little um, ENO detected, less, you know, when you show a level of uh, reading of zero, you want to think of primary ciliary dyskinesia or cystic fibrosis because it works the opposite way in one sense. So they exactly, they don't know the mechanism there. The results are nitric oxide concentration in parts per billion. That's how you measure. Now, there are some factors that affect nitric oxide. It does increase with height, and it does increase with age, as you can see. That's why you find 15 parts per billion as one limit, and then 20 parts per billion, so that's the reason. It's not huge, but it's there, um, so you need to know these factors. 
And the factors that really affect it are airway infection, as I said, so if you're sick, it does shoot it up. Allergic rhinitis, you will see some improvement. And people say, how much do you expect it to go up in allergic rhinitis? And different experts think it's around 20%. So let's say your value was 50, was 50 then it might become 60. And you can attribute that 10 to uh, allergic rhinitis, 10-ish. But if, so if your ENO is um, was 50 uh, before the fall season, and then now it's 100, you can't really blame everything only on the fall. You have to presume that the allergies actually cause inflammation in your airways. Uh, Nitrate-rich diet, and uh, the most common one is eating a lettuce or uh, stuff like that, or a hot dog or something that contains nitrates. Um, now, it protects against burping, so <laughs> it does protect against your nose, but if you burp or something, it can come up. And bronchodilator use can affect the ENO level, just like why I said the spirometry, you shouldn't do it, bronchodilators can change it. It can vary in gender, it can vary genetically, there can be a slight diurnal variation, but those truly don't impact too much on the asthma, but it may be nice to get it done at a similar time of the day. Now, ciliary dyskinesia lowers it significantly. Inhaled steroid therapy, um, ENO is very sensitive to inhaled steroid use. More to oral steroids, you'll see a dramatic uh, decrease. So therefore, if you have a patient admitted in the hospital and got a burst of steroids, doing an ENO after is not that helpful. Um, it is helpful if the level is still high, because then you know the patient didn't take the steroid. You know, that's the use for that or this patient is steroid resistant, which is the other thing you might want to explore. But you will expect it drops. So if it dropped, it doesn't mean anything except, well, you treated the patient correctly. So that's not very helpful. Now, smoking, if you had to make a guess, what would you think, how would it affect you now? What do you think, um, Maggie? If you just had to guess. I'm talking about inflammation increasing, you know, what would you think about smoking? It would decrease for the same reason that, like, ciliary dyskinesia makes it decrease. I don't know what the reason for ciliary dyskinesia, but it's smoking, but you would think it's an inflammation thing. You're going to have more of it, right? You would think smokers would have more inflammation, like intuitively. But what happens is, and you're right, you know, thinking that smoke, uh, smoking actually uh, denudes the enzyme and destroys the enzyme. And so it doesn't work just because the enzyme is not there to cause it, not because. So you've actually sort of burned the epithelium, and if you burn it, you're not going to get the marker. So that's kind of counterintuitive, but passive smoking, and Dr. Barnes helped me with a study too. We've done this, and I'll show you that data. But passive smoking in our setting did not seem to make a difference. Of course, we did more of the balloons. I don't know how it will be now if we did the ENO you know, measurement, but I've seen some recent papers say that if you're act actively smoking, yes, it affects you, but passive smoking may not be that much, unless, of course, you're walking into an, and the patient who just got the mom smoked in the car just before the patient came or the dad smoked in the car. That may be different. Now, factors affecting ENO levels, I'm going to show you a graph that show you what it is in the general population. But remember these points. The distribution of ENO in an unselected population, and I'm saying ENO because it's exhaled nitric oxide, but it's actually technically fraction of exhaled nitric oxide, which is why the F is there. So this suggests that ENO, even normal people produce it, and there's overlap of values in asthma. Therefore, we don't recommend using normal we recommend using cut points. And this graph may actually help you understand our IgE, specific IgE data, too, on some of the foods, because I suspect the same philosophy, that there are normal individuals who get some elevated levels. So, so you can see, so it, it is skewed, like I said, to the right, and it's pulled out, so it's not a normal distribution. And therefore, there's an overlap with stable asthma. And then when it goes above these values of 40, 47, they've used as cut points of steroid responsiveness. But when you're reaching more, this kind of range is getting more to the unstable asthma or the asthma. That's how they've sort of come up with this thing. What I'm telling you has come from the ATS clinical practice guidelines. And I, you know, you can see Dr. Dwight, Dr. Box, and Erzurum and other people were responsible for interpreting this and trying to tell you. But just to give you an idea, what's the main interpretation is, if it's less than five, it's low. You're not expecting eosinophilic inflammation. And if it's normal too, you're not really expecting eosinophilic inflammation. But as the levels go up, especially when it reaches this, these numbers, which you want to keep. 35 in children and 15 in adults, you're really thinking eosinophilic inflammation, whatever, or TH2-driven inflammation, and people will argue about which one dominates. So this is based on the uh, ATS guidelines, and then we also had an academy and ACI joint statement of support, of which I was part of that um, group that uh, reviewed the article. So the data and came up with a consensus statement supporting the ATS guidelines. And this was done at a time when the companies really needed all this information for reimbursement also. So let's go through a classic case. Here's an 11-year-old boy, one-year history of intermittent cough, wheezing, 
um, and then now it's become more like daily cough and congestion this fall and sometimes nighttime with amethyst. So triggers exercise, rainy weather, outdoors, no prior diagnosis of asthma. So he's 11 years old and he really was not like a known asthmatic but was given nebulas albuterol for bronchitis two years ago. Albuterol treatment was partially helpful. He got a five-day oral steroid burst which had good response. With the family history of maternal asthma and in the house he has two dogs, two cats and there's some passive smoke exposure. What's going through your mind now? What are you thinking? Is this asthma? What are the differentials? Just give me three top ones. Exposed to a lot of irritant, so it could be. Okay, could be irritant triggered bronchial reactivity. And then? Could be allergic triggered asthma. Allergic triggered asthma. It's recurrent URIs. Recurrent URIs, could it just be allergic rhinitis with post nasal drainage being the real cause of the cough and maybe the wheezing being bronchi or something? Could be that. And of course, heartburn, we always need to. What? Gerd. Gerd, it always needs to be. So these are the top four things, right, which come to our mind. And so what do we do to help differentiate? On exam, he had mucosolarifema, mucoid discharge, lungs were clear, keratosis pilaris, allergy testing showed positive reaction of two moles. Fall season, next sense. Okay, so again, I don't know if this really helps to remove any of our differentials. Um, because it just contributes to the fact that there was some uh, allergic etiology here. So then we did spirometry, and this is a real case, I'm not making it up, it's actually a real patient. So we did, FBC, we did a spirometry and what's your interpretation? Normal. Normal? No reversibility. No reversibility. No so how does that change your diagnosis? And what would you do next? How does it not change your diagnosis, What? how does it change your order of possibilities and what we do next. Well, it doesn't fully eliminate asthma. Mm -hmm. It makes it a little bit less likely and you could still do a trial of an inhaled steroid and see if it helps. Would you as your first option here? What do you normally do? Maybe more like an intermittent plan. So you're not thinking asthma is the main thing here. So the question is would you treat for asthma now? Are you treating for rhinitis and say come back? Well would you do some other testing? Well, I mean, I think in this case, me, you know, prior to spirometry. Sure, I'm going to tell you, you know, the answer, but you can't tell me that. You don't have, you know, yet. So that's the, trying to build a case for why, you know, it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. But uh, normally in such a situation, you could clinically do a trial, empiric trial, but then you have to justify why. And I showed you the data was kind of soft. It wasn't hard. So you could, the parent is going to ask you hard questions about really, do they really need any help steroids? So you might, or on the other hand, just say, let's treat you for GERD or let's treat you for rhinitis, come back and let's repeat, see how your symptoms improve, which is sometimes the clinical option we take. Uh, or if you were able to do uh, methacholine or some hyperresponsiveness study, you would do that. But of course, we are able to do ENO, so we do ENO and ENO comes back 71. Does that change anything for you guys? Did he have a hot dog punch? No, he didn't. <laughs> he doesn't have a cold. Put him on something. Yeah, so we put on something which is we call them moderate persistent asthma, mild or moderate, um, mild risk or something, eosinophilic inflammation of phenotype, triggers we've got, we review technique and he was started on baclomethazone 40 micrograms to perhaps twice a day um, and given asthma plan and asked to come back. So how did measuring the ENO help? Um, because the, the history suggested possible airway obstruction and the history was again partial clinical reverse. We didn't say it really helped. Spirometry didn't help. There was overlap with allergic rhinitis and post nasal drainage. And we could have done a BHR estimation, but that's laborious, time intensive, separate visit, and small risk of provoking bronchospasm. But we could do ENO. So while not conclusive, again, it's not conclusive, the presence of elevated ENO more than 40 as supportive evidence of diagnosis of asthma, and that's taken from the guidelines. And therefore, a threshold of 35 actually supports it. And this is really validated by the study we did together. You can see. Myself, Lafuente is another fellow who worked on this, Dr. Barnes, and we looked at real-life environmental tobacco exposure, but you could see a clear-cut difference between the levels of asthmatics and non-asthmatics. It did help demarcate. So there is overlap, as I showed you before, but it helps differentiate. Spirometry, you know, in young kids is hard, right? They don't always do it properly. And you will get a printout. So don't be fooled by the fact that there's a printout that means they did it well. ENO machine is built in for, you, for them not to get a printout unless they do a good job. So they have to do the test per standards, but a spirometry printout doesn't mean they did it per standards. You still have to interpret it, as you know. So the mismatch between symptoms and lung function can also occur just because we've seen patients have horrible symptoms and lung functions look good and the other way around. 
And as you know, testing is easy. And we've been measuring it since 2006. And we, at this time, I made this paper last year, this thing. We had more than 1,000 ENO measurements in children. And Jill actually worked with me on this study. And this is Jill's paper, which came out in the annals in um, 2012, uh, where we looked we could clearly see the difference. We looked at the age groups four to seven years, and our point was you can measure ENO in children four to seven. We had it, um, the NIOX is approved as seven and over, and we felt that there were children who could do it below, because that was my whole goal, is try to figure out in younger kids how to do, and we were able to get. As you can see, their means are, are smaller, and I told you the age-related thing that happened. Now, not all kids can do it. You know that it's a different technique, but it is possible in some of the kids, especially in the kids who are naive to how to do a breathing test. They're able to do it better, but if they use this barometry, take a deep breath and blow as hard as you can, they don't tend to do this that well. So it's a little bit how you get them. But coaching also helps a lot in this. But we have data, and we can continue to have data if somebody wants to look at this, actually. Uh, so Smith is a researcher who did a lot of work on external nitric oxide, and he compared the different tests, comparing it to spirometry and bronchodilator reversibility. And you can see it is very sensitive in picking up asthma and has a neg good negative predictive value. So it's a pretty good test. It's not necessarily the best test. It's not necessarily the gold standard test. I would argue there's no the gold standard test, even though we use spirometry historically. You'll find, just like I showed you, that patient with asthma was not picked up on spirometry. So if your ENO is less than 20, remember these causes as your differential. Non-eosinophilic airway inflammation, rhinosinusitis, extended post-viral bronchial hyperreactivity syndrome, cardiac causes of breathing difficulty, GERD, BCD. BCD is a common thing. Anxiety, hyperventilation, RAD, bronchic test, and then CF and TCD. In fact, it's now used as a surrogate kind of marker for that. They actually do nasal EN, nasal nitric oxide. But the point is that it correlates with eosinophilic airway inflammation and TH2 airway inflammation based on multiple studies and bronchial biopsies and BL and stuff. There is some controversy there, but for the most part, that's what people tend to think. So it is can be used for identification of eosinophilic inflammation. The numbers are 35 and 50. Uh, to look at. And if it's less than 20, don't think of eosinophilic inflammation as one of your top diagnoses. And this is just to give you an idea of the complexity of what goes on in asthma. As you know more and more about asthma, you'll actually understand less and less because there's so many variables. But you have we have a reactivity, you have eosinophilic inflammation, you have ENO, you have asthma, you have atopy, and it just comes together in some kind of <laughs> muddled Venn diagram thing. So. So the use of ENO is the first clinical feasible biomarker for asthma. Elevated levels are seen in asthma. It's also seen in rhinitis, as Paul will tell me many times. That he, before, he used to like, Chesra, tell me if this is rhinitis or this is asthma because of this elevation, and we would talk about the different issues. But I should kind of show you some guidelines and, uh, that may help you there. And ENO has sensitivity specificity for making the diagnosis of asthma, but it is not the gold standard. So this same kid comes back three months later. And uh, both mother and child state he's doing well. He's now on albuterol only as needed with physical activity, no nocturnal welcome, no nocturnal symptoms. Uh, as with many of our children, he misses the morning dose maybe two times a week, uh, but had a steroid burst six weeks ago because he was outside during the harvesting season. And again, physical exam is unremarkable. So when we did spirometry here, what do you find? Since Brooke answered the first one, what do you think, Brooke? That was the first free. And then now in follow-up. Still normal, but better. But better, isn't it? He's mm -hmm. improved a lot. Which means what I keep telling you guys, that please do your post because kids will improve. You can improve even more, even if it looks normal and didn't meet criteria. Of course, the first time he didn't improve, but clearly something worked here. And he did show improvement, uh, even based on what he thought was normal. And look, his ENO came down. You guys did a great job with him. So. Clearly, the medication you used was good. There was a decrease. Now, the next question is, there was a decrease. Is this significant, right? That's the question, just like I asked you with the clinical important difference. So this is what is, when you look at whether you made a significant impact with your ENO, this is what you look at. So ENO is highly responsive to ICS dosing. And there is an intra-subjective coefficient of variation in healthy subjects. So you keep repeating this ENO in the same patient. You can get four or five parts per billion difference. And it can increase to 20% in asthma patients. Therefore, only a change that's more than 20% would be considered significant. And what's important is the direction and magnitude of the change rather than absolute value. Um, also, you have to look at it with that 35 criteria. So a reduction of at least 20% in ENO for values more than 50, or 10 parts per billion for values less than 50, 
indicates a significant response. So you can actually even start documenting, say, you know, when this is a significant response, my treatment has worked. And as insurance companies and other people are looking at markers of have you documented response and what are the objective criteria, you can actually use these criteria to say the patient improved. Everyone improved by 12% and the ENO dropped by significant 20%. I've done a great job with this patient. You know, you should be able to take credit for that. And this data decreased by 49 parts per billion, which is 70%. So that's clearly a great response. So you're on the right track. You're not using the wrong medication. Every inflammation is better. And now you can actually go on the next step of can I step down. Before we were stepping down on are you better, are you not better, which depended on the season and everything. Now you actually have a marker that helps you gauge if you can step down. And you can monitor the same year. And if you go up, you know you step down too much. So monitoring every inflammation is another thing that we can do. Just like I showed you with the ACT, you can do serial tracking. You can do serial tracking with the ENO, and we actually recommend a personal best value because you will find as you do ENO, patients are different. For one patient, 50 is really the best you can get because of rhinitis and other factors that have caused it. And in some patients, it, it could be 20 less than you could come down to that. And therefore, we actually recommend tracking it seriously to get an idea of which one to do. And for now, we can say this child's personal best is 22. So you can use 22 as a marker. Even though it didn't go down to 15, I would have to use 22. Now, there are some patients who have constitutive elevation of ENO. Uh, I think Dr. Perry, who is our uh, one of our fellows, had an ENO that was always high. No matter what you did, he would take medication, everything was just high. It was just, these are constitutively producing ENO, and it, so it's not a good marker for them. So you clearly won't use it for them, but for those, you can come down, you can't do that. So again, it's a surrogate marker for eosinophilic or TH2 inflammation, which is linked to response to glucocorticoids, and you'll see that with the studies on sputum eosinophilia. People use sputum eosinophilia in Australia and use it in other countries, especially in adults where you can produce it, and they will use that as a marker of response. And we've got really good studies that compares very well with NIH guidelines uh, based stepping down when you use sputum. It's a good biomarker, just hard to do. And how do you do it in kids? And then you have to make them like gargle and get out sputum, cough up sputum. It's kind of an awkward, hard thing to do, but this is an easy one. It uh, helps, helps you assess severity, helps you predict response, helps you monitor adherence with ICS therapy, and I'm going to show you an example of that. Helps predict relapse and subsequent exacerbation. So let's take this child, 10-year-old female with, again, new onset asthma. So similar setup to that, but just then. The C act was 20, um, so the, she's saying I'm good. Um, what do you think of the FBC and the post bronchitis started to respond? or the host spirometry and post. So normal, no change, no allergies, right? But the child has symptoms of asthma. So now you're, and maybe wedded into the thought that they do have asthma, and so you're wondering next steps. So again, we could do a BHR and rule that you don't have it, but we do an ENO and it's five. So now we can use this as an indirect measure of the BHR. The ENO is normal, the child doesn't have significant inflammation. Probably this is BCD, the speech therapy stops flowing, albuterol as needed on standby. So we could do those things. Now, if the child was in flowing, so I'm guessing the child wasn't flowing, um, then you also want to make sure you have a repeat visit to make sure the flowing was not the one that caused the ENO to come to five, correct? Because you also know that patients have BCD and asthma together, so you don't want to miss the asthma being over uh, focused on the VCD part. So best thing would be to get them back in two months, which we normally would have done even after a VCD thing, but measure the ENO and make sure it is indeed low even once the flow has been stopped. So again, to show that there's a good demarcation in asthmatics and non-asthmatics. So serial monitoring, can it help predict an exacerbation? And this is a great case that I got from Dr. Spahn, from, who was a National Jewish at the time. And Dr. Spahn is, has done excellent work on pediatric asthma and also nitric oxide and non-invasive markers. But this was a patient, he was tracking over time. So this, call, this is the hospitalizations. Uh, this is a home nurse visit. And this is a prednisone burst. So there's a prednisone burst. And this is the FEV1. So you can see how the FEV1 and the ENO are opposite of each other. But you can see that so the child was given a steroid burst. And then you, the child is a non-adherent child who obviously needed home monitoring. And then it started dropping, and the ENO started rising, the FEV1, and the child had an exacerbation, a hospitalization. So again, they did probably did steroids and all that stuff. FEV1 improved. ENO started coming down. And then, again, there was another hospitalization. So then they got home nursed and paused because they were like, this child is probably not taking medication. And they made the child take the medication properly or encouraged the child to take the medication properly. And you can see the great stabilization of the same data. So 
that's of course the beauty of being able to follow it as a marker of adherence. And there's a good correlation between reduction in ENO and compliance with unhealthy lessonite. So uh, you can see the reduction ENO is greater the more compliant you are. And they actually think, think you can use that as a predictor. So if the ENO suddenly shot up uh, and otherwise the child said, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, you have to suspect they didn't take the inhaler or they did an incorrect thing or whatever, and then helps you look at that. So I, I, I'm not going to go through this table, but it's really helpful. gives you an outline for ENO interpretation in clinical practice. Um, it's in your handout, and it's in, I can send you the ATS guidelines if you really want a better copy. But it really helps you use ENOs less than 25, 25 to 50, and more than 50 in your decision making. So this is a great decision making algorithmic tool that you can go through. So to conclude, asthma is multidimensional. Uh, and please do respect that. You will respect that more and more as you learn more about asthma. And ENO helps measure inflammation, which is a key dimension. To remember for you the numbers, 25, less than 25 uh, in adults and less than 20 in children may help you know that uh, they don't have eosinophilic inflammation or have significant response to steroids. And so therefore, if they are of those low um, ENO values, you could use alternative therapies in those patients. For instance, Monte Lucas or something else, you could use those. You have to use it with other measures, just like you actually use spirometry with other measures. You use spirometry and see, you actually use spirometry in your history. So it's not like it's any gold standard. But we still need to establish what's normal, abnormal. It's still so confusing, right? The graphs I showed you, the range of control, and what about, I kept focusing on eosinophilic and TH2 asthma, but what about non-atopic asthma, which is also some of the patients we see, especially the adults that you might see at Truman. They're non-atopic, so what about them? So uh, just to take you a little bit to the future, this excellent article by Dr. Buffy and Jackie in practice, the asthma evaluation is based on symptoms, PFC, exacerbations, onset of disease, atopic state. We use the guidelines, uh, you know, treatment steps to guide us. If it's steps one to three, they're well controlled, we can all be happy. But when we go to the more uncontrolled asthma, which is steps four to six, you really have to do a personalized approach because they are complex. You know, we're doing that, right? We're measuring IgE and then we're doing anti-IgE. We're now going to be measuring eosinophils and giving them anti-eosinophilic um, uh, cytokine therapy. And ENL would also be one of those. Periostin would be one of those biomarkers that you could use and maybe bromotyrosine as it gets um, better. And you have to start doing that. And maybe genotypes, who, which patients are beta-2 recept receptors susceptible and who, who will not tolerate it, you know, things like that. Uh, and improved efficacy and reduced impairment and risk. So we're really going into the er uh, era of precision medicine. So coming to the answers of the test, I'm sure you all got it right, but the MCID for an ACT is three. I told you this, these couple of numbers are like only, only about 100 times today, so you probably got the 35 and the 50. And uh, PCD is the one where you, you should not see an elevated ENO, but you will see the deprodure. And so the causes of ENO being high despite your treatment could be steroid resistance and adequate dosing for adherence, but PCD would not be what you would think of. Questions? Um, I have a couple comments. First, um, um, thanks for the talk. I'm sorry, I missed part of it, but the, I think it's important for the fellows to realize that not all asthma is eosinophilic asthma, as Chich just mentioned towards the end. Um, 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 when I first came here, actually, we had some asthma deaths, and those patients actually had um, neutrophilic asthma, had sudden asthma deaths, and that's associated with that. And we have a lot of these viral kids that are not atopic, as Chich said. So. Um, just just because their ENO is an elevate doesn't mean that they don't have asthma. It goes back to just not using one parameter to decide to have asthma. I was curious um, to know, and you know, we've probably discussed in the past. I can't remember. Is there um, with all the the information that there is now about um, with some of the biologics and looking at patients that have eosinophilic asthma specifically that have eosinophils? Um, is there um, is there any kind of gross correlation between, let's say, a, a serum eosinophil or a blood sputum or a, a sputum eosinophilia count, let's say, a 500 that would correlate with something like an ENO of greater than 150? Or is there any, has anybody ever tried to correlate if there's any kind of rough correlation between any of those? Yeah, great question. Obviously, you would want to correlate the two because one, both are markers of inflammation and eosinophilic inflammation. So the um, Lebrick-Kizumab study, that actually looked at, that's when periostin became a big deal. 
it looked at periostin and ENL, and they showed similar trends, but periostin was a more robust marker there for that particular um, um, response to treatment. Uh, but they did look at a numerical correlation uh, between that mm -hmm. thing. They have looked at sputomyosinosis in some studies and ENL and found similar trends. But I think there's so much difference because sputomyosinosis, you actually use a cutoff of, uh, wait, is it 4% or something they used? I forget now. Do you remember what for sputomyosinosis? <laughs> I forget what they use as uh, I oh shoot, I should use, I forget. It just, uh, do you remember how much it is? I know for nasal, they're cut off. I forget what it is for normal. Oh, for sputum. Yeah. I mean, okay, I'll look look up look it up and not less than five them. per field is when you start thinking some eosinophilic like pneumonia or something. Yeah, but this is a different. Sort of, there's a there's a it may be three percent I'm thinking, but anyway, so that's oh, been used but not in a numerical correlation because pseudomyosinophilia, to be honest, overall it tends to be the more robust marker that is consistent and ENO varies a little bit more but they haven't found that. I, not that I know of, maybe there's some investigators who know that number, but uh, I don't know if they're being published. No, I've, this has been, we've talked about this ourselves in the clinic, but with, um, with some of these new products coming out that are focused on eosinophilic asthma and having eosinophilic counts you know, greater than 300 or whatever to, for, to meet the criteria for inclusion for some of these biologics, um, but my question has been, are, should we be routinely doing like a CBC and every new patient that comes in, especially those with, with significant asthma, so you have a baseline what their perfectly eosinophil count is, so that that's an option, you know, if, uh, or possible option for them, knowing that up front and stuff, you know, doing it, you know, when things are out of control and stuff. The, um, and I was just curious, you know, because we do ENO so frequently and we're not used to doing CBCs routinely on just right. you know, ask Max to come in if there was any correlation. Maybe that's a Bell's project. I mean, correlation between, like, you know, if we had ENOs that we have on a patient, if it's, again, let's say it's greater than 150 or something, we have some of those, is uh, would their peripheral eosinophilia uh, at the same time be, let's say, greater than 300 or something? Yeah. The subtle difference is that ENO is now thought more as a, of, as a TH2 marker than an eosinophilic marker. So it used to be thought initially as an eosinophilic marker, now they're moving towards a TH2 marker. And these eosinophilic medications you talk about, anti-eosinophilic medications are more eosinophilic marker regardless of TH2 status, though so many of the times it goes together. But they have looked at, to answer your question, uh, CBCs and some of the criteria for these um, entry into some of these modalities actually over the past year, not even like within three months or four months. They give, they give a broader range and they found a correlation with that 300 number or 400 number and they have a 100 and 200 and 300 graph feed, those kinds of data. Um, of course, the uh, companies that do the ESNFL studies will want you to do an ESNFL marker because it's direct rather than having to do one more test that's not related. So I'm quite sure ENO is part of those studies. I don't know if that data will come out or not. Uh, but that's a good thought. And they would want you to think that when you go to the step four to six that you need to be at some point thinking of should I be doing an ECBC step one, those three. Obviously the one to three is you're controlling them as your medications. You don't need to think of the higher range. But they would of course like you to start thinking of CBC on those patients as a, because a differentiator is do you want to do IgE or do you want to do CBC, do you want to do both? So when you're doing your IgE, you probably should order a CBC and see which therapy will be the better one for them. Yeah. I don't know that um, the start, uh, you know we thinking if we should just, for, like, especially with these high-risk asthma patients that come in, um, um, if, if we should routinely get a, get a, um, a CBC okay. and, a, and a total IgE. Okay. Next slide. Yes, last slide. Okay. So, so I'm just wondering if we, for some of these new patients that come in, if it's just as part of the initial work, just like you do a PFT or an ENO, you you do a CBC and a you know and a total IG or something. Just I, again, I'm, I would say step four to six. Yeah. That's, but that's I mean, if it's like a high risk asthma patient. Sure, sure. Yeah, it could be part of our uh, inter evaluating for IG, anti IG. We should now start adding a uh, CBC there for sure as a part of the evaluation. Yeah. ENO is, I would not say is, uh, I'm, I'm advocating it as for the therapies. I'm advocating it more as a marker of control and you get marker of inflammation and control. I do not know if, uh, I haven't noticed any ENO paper with correlation with these. There's some Zoller and ENO I've seen, but not, 
these newer therapies. Of course, these are newer, so it's people no, come out curious, only after that. Because if, again, by the same token, if let's say you have, and if there was some correlation, if you had like an ENO that's let's say less than 80, then then if you have some data that said it's less than 80, you're never going to have a number of 300 or greater or something. If yeah, know, yeah, whatever. So I would I would roughly view that that, that 20 and 25 number, 2720, as you're not likely to find the eosinophilic asthma in that person. But I don't know that for sure. I just know it's an extrapolation. But I know some of the severe asthma studies uh, that are funded by the NIH are ha are having ENO as a marker that they're using to see if that would be something. And ENO, elevated ENO, has been shown to be a marker of the severe asthmatics. Um, and some of them actually are not even responsive to therapy. They're so much inflamed. So that's been shown in these studies, the SARC study, the severe asthma studies by SARC by Dr. Erzurum and all the other uh, investigators that I have seen. I don't know about biologicals and ENO at this point. I don't know. It may be there. Okay. So Dr. Shin, the Jill studies show that children down to four years old, they can measure it. But they can get it down enough to do it? They can get down to do it. Okay. There's a slight difference in how you set it mm -hmm. to do that, to make it a little easier for them to get a good report. So yes, we did that. And these were not that Jill studied it. She studied retrospective data. So we were doing it in clinic, mm -hmm. and we still do it in clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so age shouldn't necessarily be, but how the child breathes out should be how you assess. OK. Thanks. Yeah, we have done it in some of those kids. Um, thank you, Dr. Dean Karp, for a great talk. <laughs>